Tuesday was a big day. Jesus had masterfully sidestepped every trap that had been set to either have him arrested or discredited. It was two days before Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and legal experts, through cunning tricks, were searching for a way to arrest Jesus and kill him. But they agreed that it shouldn't happen during the festival, otherwise there would be an uproar among the people. After demonstrations, protests on Sunday and Monday, Jesus was teaching in the temple and he was drawing crowds. Even some of the religious establishment, those who had worked with Imperial Rome, were being inspired by what he had to say and swayed to Team Jesus. This was good because on Monday, Jesus had frayed his movement a little with a prophecy that the temple, the center of Jewish national and religious identity, would be destroyed. And that hadn't gone over well. Tuesday, he didn't return to that prophecy during his big day of sidestepping those traps and sharing a word from God. And things were going well until the end of the day. In apocalyptic terms, he not only repeated the prophecy that the temple would be destroyed, he instructed his followers to flee. Flee to the mountains and not defend the nation. With these words rooted in nonviolence, his movement was broken. To many, now, Jesus was no Messiah. He was a coward. Now the one thing, the one thing that had been keeping Jesus safe from being arrested was the crowds. Both the Romans and their Jewish collaborators would not ri risk an uprising, a rebellion, an uproar, as the scriptures say, right in the middle of the Passover holiday. A holiday in which the people of Israel celebrate their escape and ultimate victory against a vastly superior Egyptian military force. No, they would have to wait. But if they waited to the end of the holidays, Jesus would probably be gone. He'd leave the city. The crowds were Jesus' defense. But if they can learn where he would be at a certain moment, away from the crowd, they could arrest and execute him quickly while everybody is minding their own business, preparing for the holiday. What the Romans and their collaborators didn't know is that Jesus' movement, his followers, the crowd has been divided. Jesus' prophecy that the temple would be, would be destroyed has done what their traps failed to do. So as the sun goes down on Tuesday, it has set on Jesus' public ministry. Jesus will never again teach publicly. All that he has done, all that he has taught, everything that he has said openly for the past few years is, it's over. Now, Jewish days begin at sundown. And so Jesus' Wednesday begins on what we would call Tuesday evening. Jesus leaves Jerusalem for the nearby town of Bethany. Jesus was at Bethany visiting the house of Simon who had a skin disease. 
During dinner, a woman came in with a vase made of alabaster and containing very expensive perfume of Purinard. She broke open the vase and poured the perfume on his head. And some grew angry. They said to each other, <clears throat> well, why waste the perfume? This perfume could have been sold for almost a year's pay and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. Jesus said, leave her alone. Why do you make trouble for her? She has done a good thing for me. You always have the poor with you, and whenever you want, you can do something good for them. But you won't always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body ahead of time for burial. I tell you the truth, that wherever in the whole world that the good news is announced, what she's done will also be told in memory of her. People often hear what they want to hear. Three times before they began the pilgrimage to Jerusalem, three times Jesus gave prophecy that he would be executed and resurrected. The first prophecy was right after his top disciple, Peter, calls him Christ, Messiah, for the first time. Jesus asks him to shut up about that. Tells him, get behind me, Satan. You are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Any talk about Messiah was going to invoke an image in people's minds of a militant Messiah, anointed by God to free Israel from Rome, because that's exactly what Messiah had been in the past. Jesus knew that, and he wanted none of it. The second prophecy was while they were still up north in Galilee. Jesus and his followers went through Galilee, but he didn't want anyone to know it. This was because he was teaching his disciples, the human one will be delivered into human hands. They will kill him. Three days after he is killed, he will rise up. But they didn't understand this kind of talk, and they were afraid to ask him. A few weeks ago, I had about 10 people ask me if I thought that Jesus' awareness was like Amy Adams' character, character Louise in the movie Arrival. And at the time, I, I hadn't seen the movie, so I don't, didn't know, and now I have. And yes, that is very much the awareness that I imagine Jesus having, particularly in the Gospel of, of Mark. Jesus knows exactly and accepts what will happen. The third time, he tells his closest disciples, the twelve, as they are on their way to Jerusalem, and he tells them in detail. Taking the twelve aside, he told them what was about to happen to him. Look, he said, we're going up to Jerusalem. The human one will be handed over to the chief priests and the legal experts. They will condemn him to death and hand him over to the Gentiles. They will ridicule him, spit on him, torture him, and kill him. And then after three days, he will rise up. People hear what they want to hear. After each prophecy, Jesus instructs his followers about how they're to live, how they're to act after he's gone, after he has risen up. They are to die to the ways of this world, and they are to live resurrected, changed lives as servants to one another and to work for justice for all those who are poor and oppressed. But Peter, 
James and John and the rest, they skip that part. They don't want to hear it. They imagine and that what they talk about is about when they are in control. When they have won with Christ or with God's Messiah who is risen from death. That's the story they want to hear. But there is one follower who really listened to him. One who heard the prophecies of Jesus' death and resurrection and believed them. She is never named. She decided since, not if, but since you are going to die and rise, I must anoint you now, beforehand, because I will never have a chance to do it afterward. And in that moment, she becomes the model of everything that Jesus had been trying to tell the rest of them. She becomes the servant leader that they must, that they will become, that they will become only after they die to the selfish valuing of power and wealth. She is the model of a resurrected, a changed life. And I believe that she is actually the first Christian. What she did will always be told in remembrance of her. They call this Wednesday, Spy Wednesday. They focus on the one who falls. Today we claim it in the one who rises. The woman unnamed who sets an example for us. And as she rises, another falls. Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to give Jesus up to him. When they heard it, they were delighted and promised to give him money. So he started looking for an opportunity to turn him in. Mark's account gives no motive for Jesus' betrayal, for Judas's betrayal. Later stories say that it is because he was after the money or by the influence of Satan. But Mark doesn't say that. And no one really knows. Maybe Judas saw the division in Jesus' movement and thought that without the protection of the crowd, that he would be arrested alongside Jesus. So the best solution was to betray Jesus and save himself. Maybe Judas thought that Jesus' insistence on nonviolence was foolish and doomed to failure. The truth is no one knows. But what we do know is this, that his betrayal is simply the worst of those 12 closest to Jesus. They will all fail. Even so, there is one who has already found new life in Jesus' way. Even before Easter, she is the model of a resurrected, a changed life of a servant leader. In remembrance of her, in hope of her example, that it isn't just the big name people, the 12, who change and make the world better. It can be anyone with courage and humility to listen and be transformed into a Christ-like one. Will you please rise now to sing in her honor, Won't You Let Me Be Your Servant, which is number 539 in the hymnal or on screen. 